Good evening and welcome to the Roselle Center for Healing's ongoing webinar series. I'll be your host tonight, Dr. Harlan Browning, and tonight we'll be discussing brain fit, looking at strategies how to keep your mind sharp. Tonight we'll be covering basic concepts of neurology and brain functions. We'll look at the biochemical, structural, and emotional causes of brain damage. We'll touch on certain metabolic tests that are extremely valuable to see how well your brain is functioning. We'll look closely at what's called brain span testing. It's a two-part cognitive and blood-based test that looks at inflammatory markers in your body as well as cognition skills that you do online. And finally, we will talk about things that you can do to help yourself, diet and supplementary strategies, good sleep hygiene, and we'll certainly touch upon cognitive gains. Although only weighing close to three pounds, the brain uses 20% of all body energy. It does this through the forms of glucose via a cell structure called the mitochondria. The brain communicates at 268 miles per hour via something referred to as the myelin sheath. It's composed of essential fats and cholesterol. In fact, 60% of the, the brain is fat. 20% is from an omega-3 acid called DHA, and it's not made in the body. The brain contains 20% of the body's cholesterol, and we found that lower cholesterol causes brain cell and death. In fact, in the textbook Neurology, the study showed higher cholesterol after the age of 70 has a lower risk of dementia. And not to be forgotten, lower omega-3 causes brain shrinkage and adds up to two years of aging to your life. So the question we might want to ask ourselves is, what are we doing with all these statin drugs? In order to better understand the way the brain works, let's talk about the three processes of memory basics. One would be encoding, two would be storage, and number three would be retrieval. Encoding is the receiving, processing, and combining of information in the outside world. This could be sensory information in the form of auditory things that we hear, olfactory things that we smell, tactile things that we touch. So it could be any type of sensation that the body comes in contact with. Storage, both short and long term, creates a record of the encoded information, and we call that an engram. An engram is, is a process piece of information that is stored in the brain. These can be both good and bad engrams. And the last thing is retrieval, probably the most important component. It's our ability to call back the stored information in response to some cue for use in a process or activity. Now that we have a little bit of better understanding about the way the, the brain processes information and memories, let's dig a little deeper and look at the minutiae that allows this to happen. And we'll first start, start by going to what's called the cellular level. There's a part of all of our cells called the mitochondria, and it's extremely important to the functionality of all cells in the body, especially the brain. The mitochondria is the power generator of the cell itself. It has the highest concentration in the brain, and it helps to regulate your DNA and cell repair. It does this through modulating inflammation and also help propagating the development of stem cells. Mitochondrial numbers and function drop with our age. So premature aging could be considered a mitochondrial defect. The next structure we're gonna look at is the neuron and the outer coating of it, specifically called the myelin sheath. A neuron or a nerve is a conduit that allows us to communicate from one part of the nervous system to the next. It is surrounded by a type of fat called myelin, and it helps to insulate and improve the signal speed along the axis. So the more myelin there is around the sheath, the quicker the impulse is propagated. The myelin is made up of saturated, fat, saturated fats, cholesterols, and omega-3s. When myelin is degraded, signals become weaker or slower, or in sometimes ineffective. And, and most common example of this would be a person who has multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a degradation of the myelin sheath around the nerve, which causes a lot of the characteristic neurological symptoms and signs that we see with a person who has multiple sclerosis. And these nerve networks or neurons are what contributes to what we refer to as plasticity. In other words, as these neurons are utilized, they reinforce their own network and they make themselves stronger and stronger. So by utilizing 
these nerves over and over again, the network becomes more sufficient and it becomes more self-sustaining. The brain is partitioned into several distinct areas called lobes. And in this illustration here, we can see that the front part is called the frontal lobe. The portion through the midsection here is called the parietal lobe. This portion where our ear would be would be referred to as the temporal lobe. The back portion here is the occipital lobe and deep inside is what we refer to as the limbic node. For tonight's conversation, we're really going to concentrate on this frontal lobe, specifically the prefrontal cortex, and also we'll talk about the limbic node as well. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for short memory encoding. It gives us our executive function control and it also helps to develop working memory. Most of our learning and decision making are taking place here. It, it has a big governance on our moral and social behavior. It gives us our personality and allows us to judge appropriately. And believe it or not, it has the highest concentration of mitochondria in the body. So this is really what distinguishes one person from the, uh, the other is their prefrontal cortex gives them their personality and gives them their sense of, of uh, judgment. Conversely, deep inside the brain, we see something called the hippocampus and the limbic system. As opposed to the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus limbic system is involved in more long-term memory storage. It gives us a lot of our emotions, motivations, and our, certainly our survival responses. It actively stores while we're sleeping. So when we're in deep sleep, REM, or other forms of deep sleep, it stores information. It gives us an orientation when it comes to spatial memory and navigation, and it's concentrated with the highest level of stress receptors, which most likely explains why it has a lot to do with our emotional responses. We will often see something called amygdala hijack when the amygdala, that this little portion right through here, becomes overactive and it counteracts the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex allows us to do things that are appropriate. The amygdala often encourages us to do things that aren't appropriate. So when the amygdala becomes overactive or maybe the prefrontal cortex becomes underactive, then we often will see people do things that are not appropriate for the time or place. Um, a great example would be a, a kid that has um, ADHD and, and, you know, speaks out in the classroom when he shouldn't or does activities like that. That's what we refer to as amygdala hijack. And this area is involved in the big two of brain aging. And we're going to talk about dementia and Alzheimer's specifically. The first type of brain dysfunction that we want to talk about is dementia. Dementia is an all-encompassing term for brain degradation and function. It usually falls into three categories, vascular, Lewy body, and frontotemporal. In vascular dementia, there's a slowing or impairment of blood flow that leads to the dysfunction in the brain. So as the blood becomes impaired, then we can't transport oxygen and glucose. And as we said earlier on, the brain is a huge consumer of, of energy. So when we starve it, then things will slowly start to break down. In Lewy body dementia, the issue becomes the brain starts to lay down proteins in the neurons. So these proteins are not normal to it. And as they develop, they impair the, the, the ability of the nerve to conduct its impulses. And lastly, frontotemporal is a specific lobe dysfunction. So the frontal bone, uh, the frontal area of the brain and the temporal area of the brain um, will, will become dysfunctional. And often it's related to trauma or to stress. The important thing is there's there's certain signs of dementia and, you know, these 10 that I have here on the slide are really indicative of the things that we typically see. So when you have a person that is experiencing problems, you want to track to make sure that these different signs and symptoms are not present. And certainly we want to make sure that they're not advancing forward. The next big one would be Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, the exact mechanism is not quite understood about the formation of it. We have understandings of the basics and, and the neurology behind it, but we really don't understand all the reasons that it happens. There's certainly a risk factor such as head injury, depression, and hypertension, and it's defined by finding neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques. So what's happening is 
the brain is actually being scarred. And if we look here to this little image at the bottom, we can see here are neurons, okay? And these neurons are composed of, you know, brain tissue. And what happens is these amyloid plaques and tangles get interspaced in between the nerves, which allows them, or I should say, doesn't allow them to communicate between each other. So in most cases, the Alzheimer's disease symptom pattern starts as just a generalized, I'm getting older type symptoms, maybe loss of memory, can't find my keys. Um, and in many cases, the, the first thing that we might notice is there's a loss of smell. As time progresses, then we often will see a loss of executive function, speech, and memory, and in some cases can end with organ failure. There's not an, a definitive pathway that Alzheimer's follows, so each individual is, is different, but we often find that all of these things um, will eventually take place, including the organ system failure. Well, we touched on some of the big problems that exist in the brain. Well, the question is, how do we get there? For the, those folks who've seen our presentations before, they're really quite familiar with this drawing right here. It's called the triad of health, and it talks about the three things that typically affect our health on all different platforms. One being structure, okay, that's our muscle, skin, and bones and the trauma that they sustain. One is our biochemistry, that's all the things that happen in our body in, as a result of what we eat, what we drink, and how we process. And the other one being stress. This is the emotional response to the way we perceive things in the outside world. All of these have a huge impact on the brain. So let's go through um, one side at a time to figure out what these are doing to us. When we're under chronic emotional stress, certain things change in the body, and certainly those would be hormones. Stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline are specific to allow us for the fight or flight response. However, over long periods of time or in excess, stress hormones damage neurons in that prefrontal cortex. And remember I said the prefrontal cortex is about our executive function. So when we start to damage our prefrontal cortex, we start to see changes in inhibition, interference control, and working memory. And it only takes a few weeks. So as the hormones build up and the prefrontal cortex becomes le less active, then we get back to what we referred to earlier as that amygdala hijack. Now, instead of us doing things in a proper fashion, we become a little bit more emotional. And then we, we maybe we lash out or we do things that are not appropriate. We'll see with higher levels of stress hormones, stem cells in the brain will convert to oligodendrocytes and not neurons. So instead of making more neurons to keep the pathways going, we, we cause the production to shift to something else. This makes thicker myelin sheath. It increases our fight or flight connection. So now we're reinforcing the fact that we're in a fight or flight situation. And now we start to see a faster sympathetic response. So all the comorbidities that are associated with sympathetic dominance start to show themselves. Increased blood pressure, increased respiration, changes in immune function, changes in sleep. As the brain and the nervous system gets overwhelmed with stress response, certain things need to take place to, to allow the stress response to be buffered and to be literally cleaned up. And that's done through something called the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system is a conduit in which our body can remove toxins, acidic byproducts, and other metabolites that shouldn't be lingering for too long of a time. During the course of the night, the brain does most of its cleaning and housework. And when this is occurring, the neurons can shrink by as much as 60%. Cerebral spinal fluid moves in and out, and it washes debris and inflammation out of the brain. So it's almost like a the ocean, it recedes and then it comes back in. It recedes and it comes back in. It's an extremely interesting process and that's why we feel rested the next day. If you don't feel very rested, this problem probably is not taking place. So if we build up too much inflammation in the brain, what happens? Well, we see changes like dementia. Things that will, will contribute to the malformation of of, of brain function would be interruption in sleep by apnea or not even getting into re REM or deep sleep patterns.
because it's so important, let's talk a little bit more about sleep. And in fact, let's just touch on sleep problems. There is a neurotransmitter produced in the brain called GABA, and it's an inhibitory, neuro, inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it basically keeps our mind calm. Chronic brain inflammation lowers GABA levels, meaning that as we lose the ability to inhibit nerves, then the mind does not shut down. When we don't get proper sleep, we also will see a change in blood sugar imbalance and infl inflammation that causes us to stay in too light of a sleeping mode and we don't get into deep REM sleep or deep sleep at all. Any sources of inflammation can cause sleeping problems from sinusitis to arthritis to gastritis, anxiety, etc. So inflammation will change our brain chemistry and not allow us to sleep. The interesting thing is we need sunlight exposure to help produce serotonin, which is a precursor for what we refer to as melatonin. So we want a dark environment when we're asleep at night, but we want to be exposed to the sunlight during the day. These two things help us regulate serotonin and melatonin and give us the ability to get into deep sleep. Now that we see the, the effect of stress on the system, let's look at some of the structural causes of cognitive and brain decline, specifically injury type patterns. The most common thing we see is what we refer to as traumatic brain injuries. These are head injuries that vary in intensity and damage. It can be from a fall, a motor vehicle accident, direct trauma, sports, you know, any of those type things. And they can vary in their intensity. They can be small or they can be large. It doesn't really matter because when we start to accumulate these more and more over time, we see a change in inflammatory cascades that last for days up to years. So the more times we traumatize the brain, the more we, we build inflammation in the brain. And as we talked about before, if we can't clear this inflammation or these metabolites because the lymphatic system becomes compromised, then we start to see the delayed onset damage from this inflammation. And that leads to cognitive memory and personality changes. It certainly makes sense that if we have concussions and head trauma, that that's going to cause damage to our brain. But what about other concepts of pain? What about just people who have chronic pain and how it affects their cognitive decline? Well, we definitively know that people that have chronic local or uh, global pain um, are compromising their brain function by altering their brain chemistry over time, making their sensory perception become altered, and chronically activating their fight or flight mechanism. And again, it's gonna raise things like blood pressure, respiration, and it's gonna suppress the immunity. Pain patterns lead to poor plastic changes in the brain. So as we talked about before, these nerve pathways communicate with each other and, and are reinforced. Well, if we have pain pathways that are chronically are firing, then we're gonna to start to develop those pathways over more essential networks. The overall problem with this is it causes causes atrophy in the brain with time. The last side of the triangle represents what we call the chemistry or the biochemical aspect of the body. This has to do with all the things that we eat, drink, and breathe. Hopefully our diet's clean, involves eating a lot of fruits, vegetables, and lean meats and fishes, but in many cases that doesn't occur. We eat way too many refined carbohydrates and starches, which are acidic and, and inflammatory in nature. And we often just don't get enough vitamin and minerals in the system. This comes at an expense. And the expense would be the nervous system will start to become starved. The mitochondria that we talked about won't get the energy that they need. And then the plasticity in the brain will slow down. As time goes by, then we might often see the sign, early signs of dementia because maybe our inflammation levels are just too high because our diet is poor. Specifically, we're going to talk about blood sugar regulation as being one of the biggies as far as the, the issues that happen on the chemical side. I can't stress the importance of staying hydrated. When I say staying hydrated, I mean drinking good sources of water, not soda, not alcohol, not coffee, just pure water. Studies show that about 75% of Americans are dehydrated chronically. Staying hydrated improves your brain function and importantly, the CSF production. That's that fluid. That's the buffer that um, goes around the brain. 
It helps to keep the brain clean and prevents inflammation. So that whole lymphatic process of the, the ocean going in and out and, and bathing the brain, we need water for that to happen. The interesting thing is as you age, you actually lose sensitivity to thirst. So not only are you dehydrated, but your brain doesn't tell you to drink water. And when we're under a lot of stress and we, we can transition into something called adrenal fatigue, it actually causes us to have increased urination. So we have a one-two punch here for people who are under stress. They don't drink enough water to begin with, and then they urinate more frequently. So the quickest thing that person can do to start to change their brain health right now is to start drinking water. A good rule of thumb is to take your body weight, divide it by two. And that's how many ounces of water you should have a day. And we're not talking again about coffee, tea, sodas, you know, that type of stuff. We're talking about nice, clean water. So do your math and start drinking. Every cell in the body requires energy and certainly the brain requires probably the most of it. This happens through blood sugar regulation, specifically the transfer of glucose from the bloodstream into the cell. This happens via a hormone called insulin, and there are receptors on every cell that allow insulin to move glucose into our cells. Cells become resistant to insulin, leading to glucose intolerance and diabetes. So as our blood sugar levels continue to rise, the body produces more and more insulin to combat it. However, as we produce more and more insulin, we become less responsive to it. So the body it tries to you know, correct this by producing more insulin. The issue becomes, as that happens, the blood sugar does not change. It actually gets higher and it doesn't go into the cells. So now we see a person that starts to trend to being a pre-diabetic. Well, diabetes and the lack of glucose in, in the nerve cell causes a decrease in the mitochondria. Remember, the mitochondria are the energy factories of the cell. So now we can't produce energy in the cell. Hyperinsulinemia, the increase in insulin inhibits amyloid plaque degradation. So as the insulin levels go up, the natural process of getting rid of the amyloid, remember amyloid is produced in excess in, in Alzheimer, actually increases. And in fact, you see amyloid placking in the pancreas itself in diabetics. So this is an extremely important concept when it comes to what we can do nutritionally to help minimize the likelihood of getting cognitive decline, such as Alzheimer's. An interesting relationship has been discovered between the gut and the brain. That's right, your brain and your gut actually talk to each other. And what we've now realized is that the gut provides a lot of the neurochemistry that the body produces, specifically serotonin. So when we have weakened gut health, maybe because we have irritable bowel, we have Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, or just bad bacterial content in, in our intestines, then we often see the changes in production of neurochemistry. This can lead to dementia, ADHD, depression, anxiety, and other cognitive di disorders. Because the gut is so important for absorption and utilization of nutrition, we will often find that systemic inflammation for poor digestion and imbalance of intestinal flora will propagate the whole problem. These triggers cause inflammation in the brain and damages the outside of the brain called the blood-brain barrier. So there's a direct connection between the gut and the brain. So always think about gut health when you think about brain health. Okay, so now let's get into the minutia on how we test and measure all this stuff. We talked a lot of, about neurological concepts. We talked about disorders. Well, let's talk about things that we can do to measure the likelihood of having mental and emotional issues. The first thing that we're going to look at are conventional metabolic tests that you may or may not have done as, as part of your annual exam. If you're not getting these tests done, I would recommend that you ask your primary care provider to add these in. The first thing that we want to look at are markers for inflammation throughout the whole body. There's something called ESR and CRP, which look at generalized inflammation throughout the body. They are very specific to the cardiovascular system, but they also indicate just everything is inflamed. Homocysteine is a specific marker to inflammation in the blood vessels. So 
Obviously, blood vessels carry oxygen and glucose, so we certainly don't want them to be inflamed over long periods of time. And because a lot of the cognitive issues that people develop are vascular in nature, okay, we want to make sure that our vascular system has minimal amount of inflammation in it. The next thing we talk about is ferritin. Ferritin is iron. Well, we do need iron in the diet, but too much iron can be caustic to the system. So as iron levels increase, it's got to be deposited somewhere, and sometimes that can be deposited in neurological tissue. So we want to check ferritin. And how about just the overall viscosity, the plasma viscosity? Is is the blood too thick? Okay, that's an important um, component of what we want to look at when we talk about inflammatory markers. How about measuring blood sugar? We're going to look at glucose, which is a representation of what your blood sugar is at the time of your test. We're going to look at A1C, which is a three-month indicating lag of what your blood sugar is because the life cycle of a red blood cell is about three months. And what happens is as the blood sugar um, attaches to the red blood cell, it will accumulate over time. So we can use that as a pretty good indication of what you've been doing with your blood sugar over um, a couple month period. And lastly, we want to look at fasting insulin. If your insulin level is not in range, it's going to cause a tremendous amount of problems with, with blood sugar regulation. So these three are really good markers to get an understanding of where you are on as far as blood sugar. We're certainly going to look at other markers like cholesterol, and we're going to look at clotting factors called fibrinogen. And we might even want to consider our hormone levels. What is our cortisol, our estrogen, our thyroid and testosterone hormones doing? These all have a huge influence on the way that the brain works. So as these hormones become out of, out of line, specifically cortisol, then we're going to see changes in, in brain function. We may want to consider things like allergens in foods and environmental aspects. We could look at what's called an IgG test or an IgE test. We can we can check to look at the gut health by running what's referred to as a comprehensive stool analysis. It tells us what levels of good bacteria we have. Bad bacteria tells us about inflammation in the gut. It tells us if we're breaking down carbohydrates, proteins, starches. is an excellent test to, to get an understanding of the gut function. Remember, there's a connection between the gut and the brain. Certainly, we know a lot more about Lyme's and in co-infections because that's be, become a big part of what people talk about nowadays. So we might want to check for those. If we have a hidden Lyme infection or maybe something called Epstein-Barr, CMV, these can cause neurological decline. So if a person has had previous exposure, we want to make sure that that exposure is, has been dealt with and that they're not harboring long-term viral patterns in their body. And lastly, Heavy metal testing. When we're exposed to things like aluminum, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, these have a deleterious effect on the brain itself. It causes the nerves to break down and it causes inflammation and plaquing. So if there's any indication that there's been exposure to any of these in the past, then we certainly want to have them tested. So now let's talk about something that I like to use in the office, and it's called BrainSpan. BrainSpan is, is a two-part test that gives us a great indication of where we are, both inflammation-wise and cognition-wise, in the brain. The BrainSpan is both a blood test, it's a finger prick, so it, does, it doesn't hurt very much, that looks at our omega-3 levels, that's the good fats in our body, and it compares it to the omega-6 levels. When we have a skewing to more to omega-6 than omega-3s, then we're in an inflammatory type pattern. It looks at our cell toxicity index, which is uh, an indication of something referred to as palmitic acid. And palmitic acid is a saturated fat that will gunk things up. And it gives us four testing, online testing ca capacities in the form of processing speed, cognitive flexibility, sustained attention, and memory capacity. By plotting these four tests versus the biochemical tests, it gives us an understanding of where we are as far as both an inflammatory standpoint point is and where we are in a, a cognitive state. The beauty of the test is it allows us to look at specifics and make changes along the way. The test does a great job of giving us suggestions on how we can modify 
our habits, either dietarily or exercise wise. It tells us what types of supplements we can take to help improve the area. So it's a fantastic way to assess cognition and chronic inflammation. And this is a good test for anybody. It doesn't have to be a person that has dementia or Alzheimer's. It could be just a person that wants to get a better understanding of what their brain health is like. So you might be asking yourself, all right, I got all this information. What can I do about it? Well, let's touch on some of the things that I usually recommend in the office. And although this is just a few things, um, I think this is a good place for most people to start. These are what I call the six steps for a better brain. And if you go through each one of these steps and try to implement something to improve it, I'm sure you're going to see some changes. The first thing that we want to do is we want to control comorbidities. I can't stress enough the importance of making sure that the blood pressure is in check, that we do not have elevated blood sugar. We keep our weight in a good area. We minimize trauma. Okay. We don't want to continually hit our head or cause injuries. And if we're in chronic pain, we need to do something about it. The quickest way to see the brain shrink is to be in chronic pain. So these are controllable factors that you need to assess. And if they're in place, you need to figure out a way to get rid of them. We want to reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. How do we do that? Through improving our diet. Remove the, the excess carbs and the sugars. Add more vegetables in. Are you hydrated? And if you're really inf inflamed, are there supplements that you can take? Yes, there are. We'll talk about those. Physical exercise. By exercising, we do lots of good things, in in increasing blood flow, improves motor function, which we know drives cognition. So if you're not getting up and moving, you need to do that. Can we improve our sleep, both quality and quantity? It's essential that we get good quality sleep if we want the body to clean itself. Remember that lymphatic system gets all of its heavy lifting done at night when we're asleep. And if we're not in good deep sleep, REM sleep or deep forms of sleep, then we're not going to do a good job of that. There's mental exercises that you can do to help improve your, your sharpness, reading, puzzles, and different mathematical things that can be done. And something as simple as social interaction. Get out and socialize. I can't stress the importance of that enough. It doesn't it doesn't seem that that would be so obvious, but it but it is when you get out and you interact. It has a lot to do with developing that prefrontal cortex and 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 suppressing that amygdala. Remember, we don't want that amygdala to be overactive. So let's also talk about reducing stressors, some biochemical stressors. We need to avoid things like potential allergens, wheat, soy, coin, corn, dairy. All processed foods should be removed. Things that contain sulfites, nitrites, MSGs, and preservatives should be closely monitored. These are all what we call excitotoxins. They make the, the brain go nuts. Keep an eye on the sugary foods, drinks, and refined carbs because we know that that affects your, your glucose level, and glucose is essential for brain function. If you read the label and it says it has a number, like something number six or something number five, or it has a, a color added to it, yellow number three, beware. These are neurotoxins as well. They will cause the nervous system to be inflamed. We want to eat a diet based high in vegetable quantity, and you can cook it lightly or have it raw. We want quality meats, preferably grass-fed organic. We want fatty cold water fish, so that would be salmon, wild-caught salmon, farm-raised salmon that are fed uh, corn or soybean meal, so they're not high in omega-3s at all. So we want wild-caught salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines. These are really high in omega-3s. And certainly we want to have water from a good source. Make sure it's clean. If it's bottled, be careful. There's lots of things that leach out of plastics, specifically estrogens. To give you a better understanding of the importance of exercise, I included this slide because I think it's really interesting to see. In this study, they looked at people who exercised and people who were sedentary, and they, they tracked them and looked for changes in cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, vascular type dementia, and, gen, and just generalized dementias. And if you look here, you can see that the people who are sedentary 
this pinkish color have a tremendously higher likelihood of developing all types of problems. So do yourself a favor and get up and move. The importance of eating fatty fish is because it contains something what we refer to as omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids made up of DHA and EPA compose 60% of your brain. EPA DHA is most commonly uh, found in, in fish in a triglyceride form, and it's not made by the body, so it's an essential nutrient. There's some speculation that krill oil may be better absorbed than fish oil because of its phospholipid compound. I'm still on the fence. I think they're both really good forms. And ideally, we get two to four grams of combined EPA DHA day. The interesting thing about the brain span test, when it measures our omega-3 levels, it actually gives us an indication of how much we should take to either bring us back into a normal range or maintain us in a normal range. And it's been pretty spot on when I've redone the tests on patients and have them take that the amount that they recommended. It brings them into the normal range. Well, there's certainly more that we can take for our brain besides the omega-3 oils. So I picked out a handful of other nutrients that I think are very important for good brain functionality. The first one being niacinamide, niacin or B3. B3 has a huge effect on something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is more or less a fertilizer that the brain produces to help nerves grow. So niacin promotes nerve health overall. It also increases the mitochondrial function and energy inside of our cells in, in the nerves and in with the brain. Remember, I said the mitochondria have a lot to do with energy production. So if we don't get the right amount of mitochondrial production, then we're not going to get the energy and the cells ultimately will die. Earlier on, we touched on the effects of stress, specifically cortisol and adrenaline to the brain. As I said, cortisol starts to damage the prefrontal cortex. So that's our executive function. So then what we start to see is the person's short-term memory becomes not as good and maybe they become a little bit more emotional because of that amygdala hijack. So phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylcholine help to protect the brain from those stressors. So it more or less buffers the brain from all of the cortisol effect. We're all familiar with vitamin D as it applies to immune response and immune health. Well, it also has a lot to do with cognition and the, the importance of maintaining good mitochondria. So for most folks, I recommend two to 4,000 IUs a day of vitamin D, but you should always have it checked on your annual exam. I think people who are healthy should be in the 50 to 70 range. People that have uh, maybe some underlying health conditions should be 70 or above. D3 is the prefer preferred form of, of D, and if you're having a really hard time getting your D level up, you might want to consider taking an emulsified form. That's It's it's bound to a fat dropule because it transports it into the cell a little bit faster. Most forms are in a oil suspension. In other words, one of those conventional capsules that has oil in it, so they just put vitamin D in with the oil. Well, for some folks, it's hard for them to process fats. Maybe they don't have a gallbladder, for example. So... Uh, for hard gainers, then we would look at emulsified forms of vitamin D. There's also nutrients that are really important to help control the stress response and, and ultimately support sleep. I like valerian root, magnesium, and something called L-theanine, an amino acid. These do a fantastic job of, of buffering the stress response and allowing us to get into deeper sleep. And don't forget, that's when all the, the magic happens, when we're in deep quality sleep, then the limbic system starts to, to slow down. We are able to wash the nerves, clear inflammation, and, and allow us to heal. And there's certainly other nutrients that are, are essential, but that would really depend on what, what the cause is or, or what their dysfunction is. Well, I thank you for spending this time with me, and I hope you get a better understanding of the way the brain functions and the things that go wrong with it. Most importantly, I hope you understand that there's things that you can do to both assess the brain and things that you can do to improve it. Specifically, I'd like to highlight that brain span test because I think it's so essential to give you a foundation to know where you are as we speak. 
The testing involves both a blood-based test that looks at inflammatory markers and also provides us with a cognitive test that gives us indications of where you are in working memory, spatial memory, and other forms of cognition. So on the next slide, we have a special offer for those of you that are new to the office that allows you to do this brace band testing at basically our cost. In addition, it allows you to sit with me and talk about some of your goals, maybe look at even your blood work and comorbidities and come up with a game plan to address the problem.